All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tim Taylor. I'm a board, uh, one of the board members for CFEA. I'd like to go ahead and introduce John White with the Pride Fest. He's the executive events director for the Pride Fest, and they did a great event this year. They did the parade, and they got a marketplace that was all virtual and had a great response and great, uh, you know, activities and everything that went on with that from there. So I'm happy to introduce John. He's going to go over a bunch of stuff today. Welcome. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Hello, virtual world out there. <laughs> That's how we start every meeting now, is hello, virtual world. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here today to talk to everybody about what we did as far as Pride Fest. Um, I have been in the event industry for a very long time. I was double whammy during COVID. I'm an entertainer and I'm in the event industry. So there you go. Uh, my life has been full of virtual meetings, virtual performances and everything of the sort. So, you know, a lot of the things that as everyone went through at the beginning of 2020, everyone thought this is our year. This is our year to be successful. Well, we screwed that, didn't we? Um, so it's not your year and Plan on 2022 to be your year. You know, that's what we're going to plan on. Uh, but some of the things um, about the Center on Colfax, a lot of people don't realize that we produce our own Pride Festival. And so we are only one of four nonprofits in the country that uh, produce their own Pride Festival. Typically, it's a production company or another organization that has been created to run the Pride Festivals across the country. So one of the greatest things that happened during COVID was that we were now able to put our message in front of everyone in the state of Colorado and the world that we are producers of Pride Fest, um, which is a great honor to have. This was our 44th year of Pride Festival in Denver. Um, and so it looked a lot different. Uh, fortunately, we have worked and built relationships with people that you'll see here today, Cam and Altitude and a lot of people watching out there um, that have been great partners of Pride Fest over the years for many, many years. And so when it came down to the point of what do we do? You know, we didn't have the option to say we're going to throw in the towel. We're not going to do our event. We had to come up with something to do. Again, our nonprofit relies on Pride Fest. It accounts for half of our annual budget. We bring over a half a million people to just the city of Denver for one weekend. And so we needed to figure out ways that we could kind of pause for a moment, think about the expertise of who we have on our committee and people that we have hired as a part of our production team to figure out what can we do and who can we enlist in helping us to become really creative with some ways that we can move forward to at least have some option of an event. We didn't know what that was going to look like. In that, back, think all the way back in March, all 1155 million days ago. Um, no one knew what the virtual world was. If you were not a Zoomer or a YouTuber or an Instagrammer or a Facebooker, you really didn't know what this live virtual world even existed. And so we had to rely on people within our own organization that I like to call millennials. Um, to get us into the 21st century, to help us and guide us into what we should probably start thinking about. Because we knew March, our festivals in June, we didn't have a whole lot of time to figure it out. And at that time, I'm the realist on the crew, and so I knew we were going to be in this for a while. Everyone else was like, oh, in three weeks it'll be over. Well, here we are. <laughs> it's what, now almost December and we're still in it. But we have found different ways to be creative and get ourselves in the mode of thinking about what's going to happen going forward. We can forget about 2019 and what happened before. That is no longer what's going to happen going forward. If we start thinking about planning our events for 2021, 2022, and beyond, we should not even be thinking about what happened in 2019. You're starting from scratch. We're starting from scratch as Pride Festival. We had to scrap everything that we ever thought we were going to do. And it's like building a brand new organization or a brand new event. We're starting from the ground up and we're incorporating things that we find exciting. Or maybe we had these ideas or people had these ideas on the committee and production teams so many years ago. But it just wasn't feasible because it had been a long standing event to try and figure out how to incorporate those pieces. One of them is accessibility. Think about all the people now that have accessibility to your events they can watch virtually. They may suffer from social anxiety. 
They may have, be in a wheelchair. They may have hearing impairment, vision impairment. But we were able to, in our virtual environment and realm, to bring that to them and to their television. So those are some of the real positive things that have come out of this. I am definitely a person that likes to think on the positive side and not on the negative and what should be, but what is today. You know, I don't even look into the future. Yes, we're planning for next year. We're planning three different scenarios of what that's going to be. A full-blown in-person event, probably not going to happen, but I'll build the budget for it. A hybrid event, what's that going to look like? We've started looking at that. And what happens if we have to do everything virtually? Well, we've already done that. We know that. We just have to figure out this hybrid piece. And so those are some things that we need to focus on today, what we can control and what we can think about for the future, not worrying about what's going to happen in January, February, March, because we don't know what's going to happen. You know, all of our contingency plans are there for that fact of that on March 15th or at the end of March, whatever we decide as our date to figure out what we're going to do in June, we can say, okay, on this date in March, we're making a real concrete final decision of what we're going to do. That way we have ample time to do it. We take an entire year. So as soon as one Pride Festival ends, we start planning the next years. We take about three weeks to kind of regroup and take some time off. But after that fact, we start planning it again because why? We're a nonprofit who plans our Pride Festival. We have to do it. It's part of our budgeting process. Um, and that's where we're at right now because it's October and we're back to budgeting. Um, so that's one great thing to think about there. Um, we had so many great ideas that came out of Pride Festival this year that I never thought in a million years we would be able to bring to life. We thought we would have 10,000 viewers. Well, after the weekend is over and we look at all of our statistics, we had 400,000 people tuning in over Pride Festival weekend, just like we would be in person. We have a half a million people that usually are in person at our festival, but our live parade that we had going, thankfully to our wonderful person, Lindsay, who's watching today from home. <laughs> Lindsay Barella, a lot of you know, she had this crazy idea at 2 a.m. What about if we do a virtual parade and we sell time slots for 30 seconds and 60 seconds and we have people create videos like TikTok? And, and I was like, okay, let me think about that for a minute. And then I got excited because the entertainer in me, I was like, oh, surely people are going to be wanting to do things at this time. We have hospital workers. We have grocery store workers that we want to highlight is our grand marshals and say thank you to all of our frontline workers. And how do we also incorporate in our vendors and how do we start adding in layers? So that's where all these conversations happened when we got to a virtual parade because everyone thought you are never going to pull this off. There is no Absolutely no way. And I was determined. No one can tell me no. I don't like the word no. I only like the word yes and. What's next? Um, <laughs> and so that's a challenge to me when you say no. I don't like the word no. So we figured it out. We took many, many weeks. Well, I shouldn't even say that. I would say we took many days of sleepless nights because we had three weeks total to plan this whole grand scheme. Because we started working backwards. We thought, OK, if we need to edit the videos ourselves and put them all together in this plan and we're going to put it on Facebook, we need to test it. So we started working backwards of what that would look like. Well, lo and behold, we have a brand new board member that works for Channel 7. Hallelujah. Praise you. Yes. And so he works in their social marketing department and all of their digital content area. And so one of the board meetings, it was brought up and he was like, oh, well, we can help with that. And I was like, yeah, I was speechless for the first time in my life. And so having that partnership already with Channel 7, I was like, I don't care what we have to do. I don't care how much we have to pay. We are doing it. Well, guess what? They provided everything for free. That's my other favorite four-letter word, is free. And so they provided everything. We got everyone put together. We quickly turned around what our application looked like online. We got it taken down, put back up. We figured out what the pricing structure would look like. We worked really closely with our community partners that had already signed up because we make all of our applications live in January of every single year. That's for vendors and that is also for parade entries. So we had already sold out almost 75% of our parade. We have already sold out all of our vendor spaces, our food vendor spaces and our exhibitor spaces for Pride Fest. So we had to figure out how do we go back and tell everybody now that we're thinking about going virtual? First of all, we had to wait for the city. Like many events and festivals that happen in the city and county of Denver, we had to wait for the green light to even say 
that we can go virtual because, you know, back in March and April, we're thinking about, okay, well, how long is this going to last? We still didn't know any of that. And so we had to start thinking about how we were going to work through the process and figure this all out backwards. And so that's exactly what we did. We got the applications live. We told everybody, we will give you a full refund. Absolutely 100% refund, and, and if, but if you would like to keep with us in this new environment, we will just subtract that total of what that new environment's gonna look like. And we made it like $75 to like $150 for an entry, just to keep it affordable for everybody. Same thing with exhibitors, and I'll get to that in a little bit, but for the parade piece of it, it was amazing to see how many organizations came forward and said, just keep the money that we've already paid. You're a nonprofit that puts together this for the community. You're doing good for the LGBTQ community within the state of Colorado. We wanna support you and we know that this is gonna hurt you drastically. So we had a lot of our people that had already signed up for the parade and said, just go ahead and keep the money. We'll do our 30 second spot. You can sign us up for that. We got instructions. We even went as far with instructions on how to film your segment for the parade. We did a little live video, Lindsay and I, we did a, a takeover. I highly suggest doing a takeover of a Facebook page or an Instagram page. Get influencers online to do this for you. Um, I happen to be one of them if you wanna hook. Um. <laughs> so with my entertainment page, I took over the Denver Pride Fest page. And so Lindsay and I talked about, we started getting questions about what does the Pride Festival parade look like? People had all these questions and they were the same questions. And I said, you know what, let's just answer them online live. We had almost, uh, probably about 175 people and not just in Colorado. These were people all over the country because they were other pride festivals that I had been chatting with previous to figure out how the hell are you gonna do a virtual parade? And so they came online to listen to what we had. We took live questions, we had a streaming. I use a service called StreamYard. So it allows us to push to YouTube, it allows us to push to Facebook. And so we took those two things coming through and as the moderator, I could see the questions coming through. And so I was able to answer them. And if I couldn't answer them, Lindsay would answer them. So we had great banter going back and forth to where we could have people be interactive and ask those questions. And some people would still ask the question, I'm confused, so the parade's not in person anymore? Yeah. A lot of people didn't read during COVID, apparently, um, or listen to anything on radio or television because they were living in their own little bubble. Um, it didn't matter how many times we said we were doing a virtual parade, and I would get the question, well, what does virtual mean? Well, let's look at the dictionary. <laughs> virtual means it's not in person. <laughs> That's the gist of it. Um, so there was a lot of those questions, but we, made, we, we didn't make fun of the person asking the question. We just made fun of the situation to make light of it, because it is interesting to know how many hundreds of people still didn't know what the word virtual meant come March. Now we're in October, I hope they know. I hope they know where their mute button is on Zoom. I hope they know where their turn off the camera is on Zoom and what a virtual event is because that's the world we're living in. Um, so at the end of our virtual parade time frame, we had, well I should say I had sat through, we belong to Interpride, which is all pride festivals around the world. And so in the beginning of March when this happened, I was attending every Saturday, there was a meeting with all the world leaders of different pride festivals that we were kind of bouncing information off of each other, plans off of each other, and finding out what everyone was doing. What I found very quickly is we were only one of three that were even talking about salvaging the Pride Festival to even do, try and do something because they were coming up pretty quickly because starting in May were a lot of the world leaders uh, that were creating their Pride Festivals and they were gonna start doing it. So they just completely canceled it. A lot of people said, well, we're gonna do a virtual parade. And I'm like, oh, that's great. I'd love to learn your ideas. And they were like, well, we don't have any yet. I'm like, okay, well, here are the ideas we have. Like, I'm happy to share that with you. Um, but we were the first world virtual pride parade. Um, and we still are one of only four virtual pride parades that happened throughout this entire year of 2020. Ours was the most robust because um, we did attend a few of them. Miami did one. Uh, New York, instead of doing what they had planned to do, they had their ABC affiliate, same as us, Channel 7. They have an ABC affiliate there and they partnered with them together as well to bring their virtual celebration. It was more commercials and they showed uh, clips from Stonewall 50, which was the year prior. 
they had a lot of different sponsors that came in and did videos of c celebrities and singers and things of that nature. Um, I had to pull teeth to get entertainers to be involved with our Pride Fest to make it more exciting. But thankfully, I know a lot of people. So I started making phone calls and emails to people saying, you know, we're happy to pay for your time. We just don't know what that budget looks like or would you be able to donate your time for a fun four minute video performance that we can include within our Pride Festival. I would say about 70% of them returned with saying, yes, we'll provide it for free. There were some that said, you know, give us 500 bucks when they're normally $50,000 for their live performance and we'll do it for you. So that was one of the great things that came out of it to build those relationships. Because now I'm looking at, pre at years down the road of saying, oh, well, let's bring them in live now. You know, we had them for one performance, but what's it gonna look like in a few years when we can actually bring them onto the stage in Civic Center Park? Um, so that was also incorporated into our parade element. We did not want it to be commercials because it's boring. Nobody cares that United Airlines is a sponsor and that they just have this video you can see on any TV station. We wanted them to actually get their local people together to do a fun Zoom meeting where they can record it. And AARP was one of my most favorite videos that they created, their local office, and we partner with them a lot in our stage programming. And they provided the greatest video, it was just signs that say, we love you, Denver. Love is love, we will get through this, you know, everyone matters. And these are the little signs that they just went through their little Zoom meeting, and then they had an editing person come in and put it all together. So it was 50 people on a screen, then it went to one person, and their local affiliate had a message for everybody. So it's those types of things that came out of it that we wanted to produce within it. And then Channel 7 swept in, and they had their flair, and they had their on-air talent. We typically have our own local talent that um, our MCs for the parade. But this year, with because they were providing it for free, we said, ABC said, can we have our two hosts? And I'm like, can you at least pick a gay one? I'm like, can we, can we have one gay person? Because I knew what the backlash was going to be. Because uh, I, I get all those, <laughs> all those emails. Um, but uh, they had two of their top people do the commentary for the parade, which I thought was amazing. Uh, Lance Hernandez came in, and he did a few of the buffers leading into the entertainers that were gonna be part of the parade and also our other virtual celebration. We did 23 virtual events over a three day period during Pride Fest. That tells you how hard I was working. I said, now I'm ready for my three months off because I didn't get it in the beginning. Um, so that's, that's kind of where the virtual parade aspect came into place. We have since been on conference calls. Um, we just helped the Veterans Parade in South Carolina, Myrtle Beach, put together their virtual parade. They met with Lindsay and I on a Zoom meeting. We kind of talked through what we did, how we had a partnership, and they're like, but we're obviously a government entity. We, don't, we can't charge people this amount of money. We can't ask for these things. And I said, well, then you can do it all yourself. Even if you have a team of four people, you can still create a parade. You just have to limit the size that you're going to take on as an individual to make that happen. Because remember, whatever you're saying yes to means that you have to do it now. You know, you can hire a production company if you have that in your budget. You can hire a videographer if you have that in your budget, but that's not always the case. You know, right now, a lot of people aren't making money in the event industry and people and organizations that are being supported by events. So how can we get the most out of a handshake and a we'll see in 2022 type of deal? Um, so that's how that whole piece of the virtual parade um, came to place. Like I said, we had everything go live. Of course, when you're working with places like Facebook and YouTube, we had already called Facebook, yes, we got through to Facebook ahead of time, and said, we are having a live parade on this day at this time. Please make sure that the closed captioning is working. Well, guess what? It didn't. And our chat bar on the side of that live feed was everything about how dare you, you're part of the LGBT community, you scream that you're part of inclusivity, but you don't have closed captions, you're a horrible organization. Well, luckily, we had somebody monitoring everything because we have to for hate speech. So there are organizations out there that monitor everything for hate speech, we do it internally. But when we saw that come, we can mute that conversation and take it offline. So that's what our great um, one person did the entire time. Joe, who is our social media content expert, he took every question offline and talked to people and explained it. And then those people came back into the chat 
and were okay with going forward. We still had a few of those people that we had to kind of you know, deal with after the fact, but literally, all people don't realize the amount of work that went into the parade. They still didn't realize that we're a nonprofit producing this parade. We're not a production company. We're not a for-profit organization. And educating people was the number one thing for this year's Pride Festival. We wanted to guide people back to our website so that they knew that lgbtqcolorado.org is the place to go if you need any help in the state of Colorado, and we are the ones who produce Pride. So as we see the chat features come through, it's great because you can deal with all of that thing that's happening on the side. Channel 7 was getting calls, and we were on the phone with Jeff, who is our board member that works for Channel 7. And I said, you have got, because we're hosting a live party at the Triangle at the same time that the live broadcast is happening. So I'm trying to manage this event in an offsite location, plus manage everything that's happening. And Lindsay's trying to watch, and I'm getting texts, and I'm on the microphone, and I'm like, hold on a minute. And then I have to look at my phone to make sure what's going on so that I can excuse myself to go take care of what's happening. So that's the virtual world. <laughs> it's what we have to do. I say just put on your roller skates and away we go. You know, it's a wonderful ride. And at the end of the day, we came out of it with over 400,000 people watching because we left it on our website. It was uploaded to YouTube. Channel 7 posted it there. There were like a million views by the end of it, of this parade. And so we had a two and a half hour parade that we had online. The Channel 7 live broadcast that they gave to us was an hour and a half. And we thought that there was gonna be commercials. So Lindsay put together this beautiful outline of what they needed to talk about and everything that they needed to do on the Channel 7 side. But then when it aired, they did not have one commercial, not one single commercial. So we got a full hour and a half where we thought we were only gonna get about 35 to 40 minutes of airtime. But that just shows you the importance and the power of partnerships within your community. It doesn't matter what the organization is, it doesn't matter anything, it's about those partnerships that you build with all those different organizations that in this time of a virtual space, they pay off. You know, those are the people that step up to the plate and say, you know, you're a great community partner, you provide a great resource to people within the community, so we're going to give you this time on television, which is unheard of. I think it's the first time in the 44-year history that anything has been on a national television station regarding Pride Festival. So, I mean, that was one of the greatest things that came out of that virtual parade. Um, let's talk about the virtual marketplace, because the virtual marketplace, brainchild of Carol Hiller, um, we were in the same boat of what do we do? We have all this people's money. How are we gonna return it? How are we gonna get it back to people? What do we charge? What do, how do we set this up? And so we enlisted a few people, again, those millennials on the team, thank God we have them. And we enlisted their help to figure out, you know, we have eBay, we have the Facebook marketplace, but how do you put that on a website to have a marketplace for people that rely on income coming from festivals and events by selling jewelry, food, you know, any art, anything that they have to offer that they would normally buy a booth for. And so we thought about an online marketplace. And the beauty of the online marketplace is that anyone can participate, no matter what you're selling, and you can put it out there so that there are different levels. So we created two different levels of our marketplace, and we also allowed that as a now a vendor perk for vendors that were involved that we normally contract with or for those sponsors that we already had on board that were going to continue their sponsorship. We kept 100% of our sponsorship for Pride Festival. We did not lose one sponsor. We lost two sponsors that didn't wanna do anything, but guess what, they donated all their money to us. They're like, just take our money. We, we don't want to create a virtual thing for you. We're not interested. We don't have the team infrastructure for that right now. We have already given you the money. It's off our books, so keep it. It's to a nonprofit. We're good. So that is another great thing that came out of it, 100%. Um, but this marketplace, we kept thinking, okay, well, what does it look like? Because there's different platforms, and we had to figure out what would work for our website. We didn't have a lot of time. We had three weeks to plan this entire festival, which normally takes a year to plan. So we started thinking and kind of walking through, okay, we know we wanna have categories in a perfect world, but how do we make that happen? 
We couldn't figure it out. It, didn't, it wasn't going to work. It was going to take too much power of the people to input that information into the system. And we didn't have that kind of time. So we started asking people. We wrote every single person and said, you know, this is what's happening. We made our grand announcement to the world. You might have heard we're going virtual. However, we are still going to incorporate some pieces back into our virtual festival. We would love to, for you to be a part of it. Now here's the new pricing structure. We're going to refund your money 100% if you wish to do that, or we'll refund the portion that excludes the portion that you're going to pay to be part of this new virtual marketplace. Again, $50 to $100 was all that we charged for the virtual marketplace, depending on what, what level that they wanted to sign up for. We had a lot of people that came, fell on hard times, and they were like, we need a refund. I think we had 18 people by the end of it out of 142 vendors that wanted a full refund. So that's not too bad, only 18 vendors. And so what we did is that we then took all of this and said, okay, well, we're gonna revamp what the application looks like. We're gonna give you 200 words that you can put as your description. We're gonna provide you a link to whatever your landing page is. Give us your logo, we're gonna provide that so that people can click on the link. And then if you wanna give us a video, give us a video about your product, talking about how you created your product. If you're a local Colorado product, tell us how you created it, where you sell it, that type of thing. And it can be 30 seconds long and we'll put a link to that. We didn't have a lot of people participate in that piece of it, simply because it was new at that time. So people were having to think really quickly on their feet. So they, didn't have, they hadn't figured out and mastered videoing what they want to talk about with their organization or their product. So what happened is that we built this beautiful page. You can still go on to denverpride.org and look at the marketplace. We have it there. So we kept it for the entire year because we've realized this is a need that the community wants and needs. And so going forward, we're always going to have some sort of virtual element to our world because we have to. People, like I said before, they're not comfortable leaving. They have a disability that they can't leave their home or it's not comfortable for them to go each, to each booth. So we made it to where they can search alphabetically or they can search by keyword on the website. So that's how they were able to find the different organizations. Everything, every logo, everything was put in alphabetical order. And by the end of it, I think we had almost 165 vendors that participated to be a part of our virtual marketplace, which was wonderful. Um, we didn't see a lot of return on that during the weekend. There weren't a whole lot of clicks going through it. It wasn't until after the fact. About a week after is when we saw this insurgence of click-throughs on the website, people visiting denverpride.org, and we found out that's the reason is, is because people had been going to YouTube and seeing our videos that we produced over the weekend, or they were tuning in and seeing our Facebook archive of what we had produced on our live elements and on our virtual elements, and so they were getting caught up with what we did in, within the virtual pride. So now we have this virtual marketplace and people are still visiting it. So we still have people going in and visiting on a weekly basis, clicking through to people's and different organizations. So we've continued with this model. We're now, we now are in the middle of our health um, awareness month. And so this month we created a virtual marketplace for anybody within the health industry that's um, you know, bringing awareness to mental health and to also any service that they provide. We've created that. We're creating it for our Rainbow Festival of Light that we're doing from November 15th to December 31st, where there's a marketplace. And that one we made completely free to everybody because we wanted crafters. We wanted people who make their own food. We wanted people who have art, people who do crafts, everything of that nature you would find in a normal holiday bazaar. We wanted to encompass into this month and a half long celebration, but we didn't want to focus on just the Christmas holidays. So we have 11 holidays that have been identified that happened during that time frame, and they all are based around points of light. So this marketplace has gone from being something that we put together for Pride Fest, and now it's moving forward into all these different other events that we can offer it as a service to people to gain traction during the holiday time when they would normally be setting up a booth at a holiday bazaar or at their local church or their local YMCA or wherever they would have that opportunity. And now people can go onto our website and click through. We even have people that signed up for the Pride Festival and we sent a mass email to them saying, hey, if you'd like to participate in our Rainbow Festival of Light marketplace, just let us know and we can move over your marketplace that we already have. 
This one, people are sending in video links. So they're getting really creative with product placement, um, product advertisement. And so what they're doing is putting together a quick video snippet that takes you and walks you through what their product is or whatever service that they're selling. Um, so that whole thing has encompassed into the marketplace that we're seeing kind of give back now that it's been a few months after the virtual marketplace started within Pride. But it was something that we thought was a, a great need and a great fix to what we needed to do. Again, being a nonprofit who plans an event is tricky, so we have to come up with all types of ways to generate revenue so that I can stay employed. <laughs> and everybody, yes? Well, we talked about that, um, and because we don't do it at Pride Fest in person, we didn't want to do that virtually. So when someone signs up to be an exhibitor at Pride Fest, we don't take a percentage of any of their sales. Now, with our food vendors, we have that agreement that we do, but when it comes to crafters and artisans and t-shirt sellers and things of that nature, we don't do any of that. Do you think you would add it in 2021? 2021, we are talking about adding that, that piece into it um, at a certain level. So we're gonna, again, offer the two different levels for Marketplace. We realized that we sold ourselves short as far as pricing, but because we had to quickly think, and in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, a lot of people are gonna be out of work right now. So if you're trying to keep your business afloat and sell products that you would normally sell in an event, what's a feasible you know, number that you would be willing to pay to be a part of this virtual marketplace? And so that's kind of where we came at it this year. Next year will be a different story because we had so much participation at that smaller level that we can bump it up a little bit more. We're not gonna get crazy or anything, but we also wanna be able to make a little bit more on that side of it, yeah. So some of the other things that we did um, virtually, we did a virtual 5K. Uh, those are things that have been happening forever and ever a day. Um, but with it, we offered a drive-through packet pickup service. Whew, I made it through that packet <laughs> pickup service. It's a lot of peas. Uh, so what we did is we made every, so we kept all of our events on Pride Weekend. We didn't move it to the beginning of the month or the end of the month and move things around. We wanted people to get used to it being on our normal weekend. So what we did is we created a packet pickup that was drive through And so we had a couple, we had a sports drink vendor come in their van. We had like a veggie crunch. They had like these veggie chips and stuff. They were there. And then we had a tent set up with our um, 5K manager, Shannon, and she set up a t-shirt station. Everyone got up. We created medals this year, which was that stay at home logo um, that Facebook created. So we made that our logo. So we called it the stay at home pride 5K. And so everyone got a bright pink t-shirt that had a rainbow heart on it with a runner because everyone was gonna run from their couch. That's what I said. So again, <laughs> We used social influencers to get people involved. So we did a Facebook takeover of our Facebook page of not just Denver Pride, but also the Center on Colfax. We did two takeovers and talk about what the 5K looks like coming from your living room, you know, in your neighborhood, on your trails that you, prov that you have in your neighborhood. You're going for a hike, all these types of things. Because again, in June, we had a little bit of a restriction lift that we could you know, gather, start gathering in place. So we wanted to keep people, a, people safe and socially distanced and also for us to be responsible at what we're asking people to do. The greatest thing that came out of our packet pickup, people dressed up in their cars just to pull through the drive-through. They brought their kids, they brought their animals, and they were all decked out in rainbow gear. We have so many pictures that we took and we didn't expect that. but. You know, we expected that we would probably have 100 runners. We went from having our very first year of doing the 5K with this new organization, having about 400 people to in 2019, we had 1,200 participants. This year, virtually, we had 650, which we didn't think we were gonna get. Um, but we were so happy about that because as people were getting into the groove and we ha had a traffic pattern, we had a few of our volunteers come and they were out with flags, waving them to people, getting them guided off of Colfax into our parking lot. And we made it a way in and a way out to make it fun. We had music blaring. It was kind of a weird, gloomy day. And so, but when they came in and they got a sports drink and they got this gigantic bag of veggie chips 
And then the next station that they go to, they're getting a t-shirt and a bib and all these different types of things that they, you know, and when they reached a certain level of fundraising, they got extra things. So that's when they got the medal as if they reached over a hundred dollar goal. So we had a lot of those people. We had like 150 of our 650 participants that reached $150 or more. We actually made a lot with our 5K as far as fundraising that we didn't think we would ever do. But it's because people started creating campaigns online through the website that we used for the 5K that they can create their own campaign page and they can send it out to their friends and family and say, hey, I'm running for a cause. And so if you wanna donate, click the button now. So we did a lot of that through fundraising. So the 5K was really successful. And then on the morning of, so Pride Festival weekend uh, was a Saturday, Sunday. So each morning we went live on Facebook. And so we started our day off like we normally would. We did a welcome to everybody to the 5K. We had a schedule outline. Uh, I sang the national anthem for everybody before they got ready to take off. We talked about stretching. We did some st crazy stretching, um, just to be silly. Uh, <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. And then away they went. And then we cut from our live feed and we went back to some things that we had online that were just links that people could tune into. And then we went in and out of live. We went six times live on Saturday and only two times on Sunday. We did find that going live more often prompted more people to tune in and get more interested. So we do know for the virtual element in 2021, we will continue to do that. Um, so that takes care of our virtual. I'm having trouble hearing you. I didn't even say Siri. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> it's like Alexa when you're sitting at home and the TV says, like when I watch Schitt's Creek and they say Alexis and Alexis like, sorry, I didn't understand that. I'm like, I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> It was the television, but Big Brother's not watching. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so any questions so far on Marketplace, Parade, 5K? Yeah. yeah. With, with all the numbers you were talking about, with attendees and other you know, locations that were doing things, why do you think people can't get that? What do you contribute to making it so many attendees and so many people attending and all that? I think the biggest reason is because the LGBTQ community are fighters. We're not people to give up. We have always had to fight for our place at the table and our place in society. And so I think that that was the reason why we had so many people. A lot of people were coming out because this is the one thing that they look forward to every single year. And yet, while they were disappointed in not having an in-person, they understood it. They were just happy that we were doing something. They were happy that we didn't throw in the towel and just say, you know what, you're on your own this year. Because it's not, for us, Pride is not just the month of June. It's every day of our lives. You know, it's not just one month. So, you know, we had to get people through that whole process of thinking, you know, yes, we're not having a full-blown event. But guess what? You don't need to have our weekend event to show your pride in the way you celebrate in your community. So that's why we started campaigns. We did campaigns of decorate your door, decorate your balcony, decorate your apartment, decorate your dog, your children. Um, and so we had people start sending in videos of people just decorating their houses and their front lawns and things of nature to show their pride. And we also had a lot of allies that came on board and just gave videos testimony of why they celebrate pride with their family because it's important to them and this is why. Um, so I think that's the reason why we saw a lot of those numbers also because we were able to be visible worldwide. We weren't just now pigeonholed to Denver. We, I had been a part of all these conversations in March and April and May with our different pride alliances. And so they were sharing it on their platform saying, everyone needs to go support Denver Pride. They're doing all this stuff. Go watch something. Like click on a link, watch the parade, go watch a live element, tune into the 5K, whatever, just support something that they're doing. And so I think that's a big reason why we saw such an uptick in numbers. Yeah. Um, another great thing that we did online, we incorporated an online auction. We had a silent auction online that we did. We will never do that again. <laughs> I learned a lot of things of what to do, what not to do, where to put your energy. Um, we did virtual entertainment stages. So we normally have a couple different stages throughout the festival. We have our main stage, we have a Latin stage, and we have a youth stage. We took all of them and combined them together this year. 
And I reached out to the managers of those stages and say, reach out to those people that normally volunteer their time and have them put together videos. And so we had a lot of video content. We normally have a few headliners that are on each of our weekend days. And so I started reaching out to a lot of the RuPaul Drag Queen uh, folks that I know, and they donated their time. We had people um, from all across the country, especially production companies that we've worked with to gather musical entertainment. And they were like, here are five videos that Boy George put together. Choose one and put it up on your platform. You know, those types of things. So they knew that it was kind of a tough time for everybody, so they wanted to get involved. So that was another element that we did. We did a lot of entertainment-wise. We, we made sure we had entertainment for kids and families, so we did story times. We had crafting videos that people could go watch. Um, we had our Latin stage that where everything was done both in Spanish and English that people could tune in and watch. And these are all things that people provided to me ahead of time and then I just edited them together into their hour and a half time slot that was on each of the days. So each day had a Latin stage performance, a youth performance, and a main stage performance. So we broke it up over the two days. Yeah. So when you, when you talk about potentially doing a hybrid event, Yeah, that's a great question. And so we've already started that and talking with community partners. So the way we're looking at a hybrid is keeping, we're, we will probably for the next year keep our parade as a virtual element and not even consider doing an in-person parade simply because of the masses of people that come for that. We have no control over it. But we do have control over how many people come to the festival grounds and therefore. So within a hybrid event, we're looking at, instead of being in a physical space of, the, of just the surroundings of the park, we're talking about involving our community partners. So restaurants and bars along Colfax and through all of Denver that we can be in their parking lots at a socially distance. So we would have fencing, we would have stages if they wanted to be that type of a, of a sponsor, and we would have live entertainment. We would have, still have our porta potties. We would work with our food vendors to say, hey, can we have two food trucks come to this location? We're gonna have five at this one. We're gonna have some vendors that are around the corner on the block. So it's gonna require a lot of strategic planning on our part. That's why we started already looking at that hybrid. Correct. Yeah, and it, and it allows pockets of people to be safely in one area. So if our restriction next year is we can only have 50 people in an outdoor event, then we, if we work with community partners, we can have, we can control how many people are in that setting because we're creating a fenced in area, we're creating a safe area for people to be in. You know, the vendors would also count in that. So depending on the restaurant or the bar that we work with, now some of them may not have a parking lot or they may not have a space to hold it, but that's when we start working with the city to permit streets, street closures, to do a block party. Um, we do a lot with Triangle Denver, and so they've always done a block party for the last two years, and they fence off all of their portion of Broadway and the alley. So working with places like that that have the space and already were the relationship where they've done it before. So talking to them and figuring out, okay, well, how can we take your, what you've done for three years and offer that to Hamburger Mary's and offer that to the film uh, festival. And so each place around the area of Colfax and East High School, you know, they have a big farmer's market that happens there. So how can we utilize their area in that circular spot where that fountain is to put in vendors and make that like a little, you walk in one way and everything's gonna be a one way access, walk in one way and exit the other way, so. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, we don't want to we don't want to pigeonhole ourselves to where we have like one stage at one bar or restaurant that has like a headliner. So we want to keep everything local to Colorado. So we want to keep everything local entertainment, local people that have been out of work for the last year and a half and help promote their business and help promote their artistry and get them back on, on in the scene again. Yeah. Yes, we uh, um, are talking about going cashless everything this year, this next year, if we have an in-person element. So everything would be wristbanded. 
and in your wristband is kind of a microchip that you sign up everything online for your time frame to come to the festival, no matter where you're going to go, because we would limit that amount of people. It would also have your credit card information, your ID, all that stuff. So when you walk up to one of the kiosks, you just flip your wrist and away you go. Um, so yes, we are. We have already been in conversations with quite a few companies about creating that timed, and that's the number one thing on our mind. Is if we have an in-person element, is how we can make it a timed event. How we can make it. We never charge to get into our festival. We don't want to start doing that. So we still want to make it free to everybody. But how can we control that free entry time? So that's why we're looking at having an hour and a half time frame for each group, and then they can move around to the next spot. Yeah. Anybody else? Good questions, love that. Uh, another thing that we did is a text to give campaign. So we set up a, a text number that they could text Denver Pride to the number and people could submit a donation. So that worked really well. Um, as I said before, we did 23 different virtual events throughout the weekend. Another great partnership that came out of all of this is Rocky Mountain PBS. I cannot speak their praises enough. Um, they did a television show for us that started out as a conversation in my backyard on the phone just saying, so what can we do? Like they wanted to come on as a sponsor and so our development director called me and said, can you join this conversation because I think you're gonna have a lot to add. Well, that's the wrong answer because I have a lot to add when it comes to asking and giving me money. <laughs> Um, so, of course, all of their high-level people from Rocky Mountain PBS are on the phone, and I jump in. I have no idea what the conversation's about, and they're like, well, we just want to know how we can partner. I was like, oh, this is a great idea. So I went off on about 50 different ideas, and Kim, their marketing director, she's like, I see that we're going to have to have another conversation. <laughs> I'm like, not just one. I think we're going to have to have about 100 conversations, because I got a lot in my brain that I want to do in this virtual world. Uh, and luckily, they were on board for everything. They never said no. Their answers were yes and. What can we do more? How can we provide more exposure to your festival? They were already in the process of, of doing the virtual, um, I think it's the Five Points Jazz Festival that they were working on at that time. And so they already were working in this virtual. They had crews going out remotely to record people, so they already figured out how to do that socially distanced. And so they came up with the idea as I was talking through all the elements of Pride, what we were doing virtually, and they were like, well, how about we just record all of your entertainers that are gonna be on the main stage, and we'll put together a package, and, but we'll show it on television 11 times during the month of June. I was like, well, that's a win-win, of course, let's do it. So we worked with our production manager of the main stage, uh, and DeMarcio's been doing it, this is his 19th year of being our MC of the main stage and gathering all the local entertainment. So we gathered all of our local entertainers. We chose 15 people to be a part of the filming. Uh, originally, they wanted to highlight four people that were going to be performing and do a backstory and go to their home and talk to them. They ended up doing that because of logistically and how quickly we had to move. And then they saw all the performances and they were like, well, we, just, we wanna use all these performances. We can't just choose four. And I said, yeah, that's what I was trying to tell you. You're not gonna be able just to choose four to highlight. So. We went and we met at the Triangle, uh, socially distanced, in the beginning, uh, oh no, it was the end of May, it was right around Memorial Day. And of course, things were hot and heavy then with how many people you can have in a space. So we had to work with their production crew, there were a lot of hoops to jump through, but it, they made it seamless and easy. We worked with the Triangle, we had to have sign-in and sign-out times for each of the entertainers that were coming to be filmed. They had to come fully dressed, they weren't allowed to bring any, anything with them into the space, no people, no suitcase, no extra clothing, none of that stuff. We had everybody walk down a hallway, they stood in line about 12 feet apart from each other, because we only had three people there at any given time. They came through, they came around the corner, they did their performance, they had one shot to get it filmed, that was it. And I said, just pretend that you're there festival morning. What are you gonna do if you mess up? You move on. And so we had, of course, there's always one in the group, right? One person that, that messed up and she just basically said, well, I'm, I'm, no, I'm doing it again. I'm like, you can do it again, but I'm just not gonna show you on television, so go for it. Um, so we went through that whole process, got it done, they edited it, they videoed everything. And then, but what I didn't know is they went out to every little small town in Colorado like Rocky Mountain PBS does, 
and they found queer families in all these little tiny pockets that they did interviews with. So they sent crews out to follow these people. And we had a fabulous transgender community that lives all the way in Palisades. And they, their story, I mean, it moved me to, it was amazing to see everybody that relies on Pride Fest to show their family love and acceptance, and especially the kids. They tried to focus on, on families, um, same-sex couples and families that had children. And so in that process, some people that I know were part of the interview. And I didn't know their entire journey or their story. And they've created this beautiful farm of acceptance. And they have animals and goats. And it's a safe haven for queer families to come to learn about farming and sustainability and how to take care of yourselves and be in kind of a zen place. So that was these, all these little tiny stories that came out of it were just so enlightening to me that I was like, I wish we knew this. But now that we're in a virtual world, guess what? We can have more of a backstory. I, I call it the American Idol. You know, we're living in the world of American Idol where everyone can tell their backstory now and you can be a horrible singer. It doesn't really matter. As long as your story's good and you're living your truth, that's all we really care about. Um, so Rocky Mountain PBS was really a key for us in getting that exposure out there. We worked with the census. The census approached me and said, we would love to do a virtual show. Can we be a part of the festival weekend? And I said, well, what does that look like? You know, what are you tr what's the message you're trying to get across? Because we have to kind of dig a little deeper, being a, a nonprofit. And they simply just wanted to encourage people to participate in the census. Very simple thing. You know, it brings money to each and every community. It's an important thing to do, just like voting. It's our civic duty to participate in these things. That's why we live in the United States. Um, and so for me, I was like, okay, well, let's do it. So we gathered burlesque performers. We had singers. We had drag entertainers. We had magician. Um, and then a couple of us hosted the evening. We recorded in a private studio with a cameraman and the two of us, and again, we were able to be safe and socially distanced. Fortunately, I was one of the MCs, and the person I was MCing with had been part of my quarantine bubble, because you know, you should have created those in March. Uh, <laughs> your little quarantine bubble that you're around all the time, and you know what they're doing, that you get tested often, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so it was a great way for us to put that out there, but then their viewership was even more exposed to the people in the LGBTQ community because it's the first time in history that the census was asking specific questions to our community. That's why it was so important because just like only one in five people within the queer, queer community vote, we only had probably about 10,000 people in the state of Colorado that actually participated in the census previous that identify as part of the queer community because the questions didn't line up with how people identified, with gender identity, any of that stuff. And so for the census and the government to start recognizing those things, I say it's about damn time. Um, so that was why it was so important for us to participate in that census piece. So that was part of our weekend. We use that as our kickoff virtual event because for me, I was like, okay, we can test this and see if the virtual elements are gonna work. Because Friday night, I have time to fix it between Friday night and Saturday morning when we're going live for everything festival related. So luckily we went live, everything happened perfectly. The census folks created their own little watch parties. We had a lot of people commenting. We were able to respond in real time. That's one of the beauties is that I find there are a lot of opinions out there, but when you get people behind a keyboard, they become even stronger. Um, so it's, it's, it's weeding out through all of those types of things. And luckily when you're an administrator of a social platform, you can mute conversations, you can remove it from your feed. Um, again, that's why it's so great to have organizations out there that, that monitor hate speech on, it doesn't matter what type of an organization you have, there's always hate speech out there. People are against something, I just, I don't know why. I mean, we are in COVID, so we should love more and hate less. Yes? I've got a question, as, as I've listened to the success of what you guys have done, and it sounds like you're kind of a juggernaut, if not national, international, from what you guys were, what you said. The virtual part of this sounds like it's gonna, this is the new normal for you guys. Yeah. Staffing wise, would you use 100% of your staffing that you would normally position for the physical part of it? And then do you feel that you can grow that appropriately when it comes time to have the hybrid part of it? Yeah. Uh, yes. 
Sure. Oh, absolutely. So the question was, is taking what we did as far as the Pride Fest and how ro robust it was, uh, did we utilize fully the people that would normally put on Pride Festival physically? physically? And obviously the virtual part of it will become part of the normal progression of Pride. But do we think that that's enough people moving forward or do we need to add to that? Was that right? I know I'm paraphrasing a lot. Okay. So yes, yes, and yes. Um, so the virtual elements will always further be a part of everything that we do because we have, uh, we've listened to the community and they need it, they want it. Um, the second part of it, we, most of, uh, I would say 95% of our festival is run by volunteers. So our pride production committee, which is five of us total, we utilize them 125% this go round. Um, people were doing things that they never thought that they would have to do in a million years. People were having to rethink of what they've done in past years and other events and bringing that expertise to us and saying, well, we kind of did this a few years ago, but this is what worked and what didn't work. And just kind of spitballing ideas because nothing was a wrong idea. There, was, there were no bad ideas that came out of it. It was just, what could we do in that short amount of time? I do know going forward that we need a lot more people help on the technical side. So we need to have, we either need to hire a production company company, or look at the base of volunteers that we have on our uh, Pride Fest committee to say who has virtual expertise, who has video experience, audio experience, all of that kind of stuff. And we kind of asked that in the beginning, but because we were moving at such a fast pace, people were like, oh, I don't want to get involved because we don't know what's happening. Um, so, but I know going forward, we will need to enlist more people on that side, especially in the hybrid model. Like we're going to need almost double, triple the amount of people of what we normally have, simply because we're going to be covering um, a broader circumference of the city. We're not just going to be located in one park. We're going to try and spread the love everywhere, but we're also relying uh, on, a, on a portion of that to be put on the p community partner. So if Tracks or Triangle signs up and they want to be one of those community partners, we're really going to put the onus on them to create their bubble. We're going to give them the fencing vendor. We're going to give them the porta potty. We're going to give them the food truck, everybody's information, and we'll stay as the conduit. But coming to the planning side of it, uh, we want them to take control, and we will be there to support with our vendor base, with our volunteer base, everybody that we would normally have in that small space, and we would still obviously be paying for it. You know, we're not going to ask them to shell out you know, thousands of dollars to put up fencing and all that type of stuff. We're going to take care of all that, just like we normally would in the festival. It will be a bigger budget. We already know that, but we don't know what because it's all hypothetical. Like we don't know how many community partners we have that would be interested in something like that, or come time of March and they say, okay, well you can have 100,000 people a day in the park. Then we're gonna be like, okay, perfect. We're gonna go into the park and we're gonna set it up as normal because we've gone back and forth. Do we make it a one day festival? Do we make it the two day festival? No matter what, our costs are the same. So whether we make it a one day or a two day, it really doesn't matter. If we move to a different park, doesn't matter. It's still the same hard costs that go into it for safety, security, and for accessibility for everybody. So we, in our, in our perfect world, we want to keep it as a small event. I would love for them to say you can have 100,000 people a day in the park. And that'd be great because then we can time it out. We would do our time ticketing system. So that's also an element in our hybrid version is that not just the community partner, but thinking about a scaled back version in the park. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Perfect. Any other questions on that? Online, yeah? How do you manage if you're doing like online tickets? Um, do you cap the number of tickets that you have per event? And like how do you, how have you guys structured that? Um, or how do you plan to structure that? Um, with like an online service that they put in or something like that? And then, and then like spacing out this many people or like this time and then this time. Yeah, absolutely. So the question was, how do we um, account for people that are going to be ticketing? What's the time structure? Do we have a company that's going to do that? Yes is the answer to that. I don't want to take that on. We're a nonprofit. I don't, that's not my expertise. Um, so we've already been talking with about three different uh, ticketing organizations that provide the wristbands or some sort of, you know, less of an entry point where you're dealing with people in, you know, face to face. 
So a yeah, part of those systems are the timing system and all of that. So they would, we would handle that through a third party service. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot, especially when you're an outdoor festival. It's not the cost of the product or the wristband. It's the cost of the Wi-Fi because the Wi-Fi is shit everywhere in Civic Center Park. And when you have 500,000 people in the park using their mobile device, yes. And we have tried over the years. I've been involved in, in Pride Fest. This will be my seventh year. Every year, we have, we have worked with Comcast. We've worked with Quest. You name it, we've worked with them. It doesn't matter who we work with. The signal is awful. And even we've put in private lines when we had a VIP area that people were checking in and purchasing a ticket to, and th you would still have a down line from time to time. And so you had to move to paper and pencil to do everything. So this com the companies that provide the wristband company, they come with a global service that they bring in these trucks, and it's ping points for their, for their access. It's like $125,000. That's the cheapest one that we have gotten a quote from, just for the Wi-Fi. That's not the product or the manpower or the, any of that stuff. Yeah, so we're just gonna find a sponsor for it because there's a yes there. <laughs>
to 15 days, they said, to refund, but the cash goes back on your debit card or wherever you want to do it, they'll send you whatever. They give you like all that information. So they take care of that piece of it to refund you after the process, which is great. Because a lot of times, you know, for us as a festival, people will buy the strip tickets, but how many people use every single strip ticket? There's never the right amount there. That's why it drives me crazy. And so that's a lot of you know, people's money that you're just leaving on the floor as a ticket at the end of the day. And so people don't realize that. So with the, cat, with the wristbands, they're gonna notice it because it's gonna take out in real time the money that they're gonna spend. Yeah. Oh goodness, yes. What do we do in 2021? Well, we're planning for 2022, really. Um, everything that we're sending out, because we're, we're gathering bids for next year's Pride Festival, because we had a few of our vendors that have either gone out of business or they're just no longer interested. So we've had to go out and seek these types of contracts. It's interesting to see what we're getting back in return. Um, our audio one is the biggest one because we have a, a lot of audio needs. We have mobile staging, all that kind of stuff. And so we found in Colorado, there aren't a whole lot of production companies out there. And so of the players that are there. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. It's true. There's only eight. <laughs> Small number compared to other cities. Um, and so we're go we've gone out to bid with a lot of companies that have either placed bids on the contract before, because it's a hefty contract. And we're finding that either people we've reached out to are no longer in business or that person's gone. And so this is the thing I say to organizations that have lost infrastructure people, forward the damn emails. Like, if you know someone left, don't leave it in their email. Like, forward the message. How hard is that to do? It's amazing how many now return emails I'm getting from March, and we're now in October, saying, oh, so-and-so no longer works for the company. I said, well, didn't you know that in March when I sent the email? <laughs> Like, if I'm now getting a bounce back, that means you just put on their forward message email. Um, and so people lose out on business that way. And so that's the thing that's the most frustrating now, looking ahead. And I'm finding a lot of people won't even give us a bid. They're going to give us a general, but they're like, we're not sending you a contract. We're not sending you a proposal. We're not getting locked into anything. Um, that's the other thing we found out during this process is how many companies don't have a cancellation clause or a force majeure, uh, all those types of things. Um, so we've gone back to all of our vendors that don't have that and said, please add it, because we want to treat everyone fairly. We want to do the right thing, because we're building relationships. We're not just a one-off event that is going to be around for four or five years. We've been around for 45 years. And so we want to have long-standing relationships, because it only makes my job easier when we start planning for the next year, when people have already done it for the five or 10 years before that. Just like the people on our committee, you know, we have people, collectively, there's 179 years of event expertise just in Pride Festival on our committee of 23 people. And they're all volunteers, except for three. That's it. So we have three paid production people that we bring in for the Pride Festival. Everyone else is a volunteer on the committee itself. And so to have that much of an expertise in the room is just really important to us because, again, we're building relationships. So when it came time for us to say, hey, we got to go virtual, they were like, what the hell? They weren't. They were like, okay, well, we get it. What can we do to help? What do you need us to do? How can we get the word out? Yeah. I was just going to say on the contract front, um, because we were in that situation, we didn't have we realized our contract was pretty weak, actually, and we weren't really holding people to it. Uh, we reached out to Stephen Edelman, who's from the ESA, yep. and is also an attorney. And uh, so I worked directly with Stephen. He completely rewrote our contract, and it's all like COVID-19 everything. Yeah. It's, it's long, but yeah. it is legit, and you it is to. ready I mean, to it's, go. It's, 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 so. our new, it's our new thing in the event world. Yeah. People have to look at the contract because otherwise they're getting shafted on the end if it does get canceled. Yeah. yeah. And at this point, we send it out, and if somebody has an issue with it, I'll explain it to them, but it's not negotiable pretty yep. much at that point. So. Yeah. That's, great. That's the one thing I can say to everybody. Look at your contracts. Even me as an independent entertainer, my contract didn't have anything in it. But there were a lot of entertainers during this time. Like We had contracted already with two entertainers to be our headliners. And we had to enforce the force majeure clause because they were like, no, we want all of our money now because it's in our cancellation clause. I'm like, this is a worldwide pandemic. Take your ego out of it. I get it. You want a paycheck. But guess what? 
a worldwide pandemic. <laughs> You're not the only person in the world that I'm worried about right now. Um, yeah, so looking at all those things, it's, you know, we have learned a lot throughout the time frame of this entire virtual year. We know exactly, like I said before, what we want to continue doing, what we want to stop doing, things that we just added in to see if it would, if it would stick. I am not going to focus on 23 events over a weekend uh, for Pride Fest. We do have some exciting announcements. I'll give a little teaser. I'm not going to tell you what it is. On November 9th, look at our social platform. We have some big announcements coming for what 2021 is going to look like. We have um, created a new partnership within the city of Denver, and so we're excited about that. Um, lots of good Pride Fest news coming out then as well. Are there any other questions online, anywhere? Carol, if you're listening, Lindsay, if I forgot anything. I know, she's listening. My, my, my wrist has been blowing up and it's not Siri. <laughs> I know, I know, yeah, yeah. Yes? You had said earlier in the presentation that the, I think it was that the live auction went terribly. Yes. Uh, but, but you didn't really address why. What, what didn't work and is there a way to salvage something for the future or is it? Just a no-go for launch. People don't have expendable incomes anymore. Um, so to think about a vacation that you're never going to take for at least the next two years, to think about artwork that do you really need to spend $1,000 right now on a piece of artwork? Mm, probably not. You know. So I think we were too early in the process. I think June was just too early for people to think about that. And we, the things that sold in our, in our virtual uh, silent auction were things that people could use. Camping gear was a big thing. We had a bidding war go on. We had this whole camping gear package. Um, so we had a bidding war on that. We had movie tickets. And I was like, OK. <laughs> but those sold really quickly. And I'm like, well, I don't know when you're going to use them. but. <laughs> You can have them. I do a lot of events at Alamo Draft House, and so they pay us in movie tickets, and so I donate them to everything. I literally have a windowsill stack like this, and I'm like, now what the hell am I going to do with those tickets? <laughs> They're useless. I should have asked for a cold, hard cash. <laughs> so going forward, I learned a lesson. Every contract has the word cash payment or check, <laughs> not product. <laughs> I don't need the product anymore. Um, so it's, it's those types of things with the virtual. I think we were just too, we were too much in the front end of that piece for people to think about. You know, it was June, so people were just getting out there and starting to live a life. And now we've opened these movie theaters, but they don't take the vouchers. You know, you have to pay for the $150 fee, which I highly suggest people doing. If you want to go see a movie with 14 or 20 of your closest friends, Alamo Draft House at Sloan's Lake, it's $150 to rent the theater. You get the choice of eight movies, and you can invite up to 20 people that they keep socially distanced in that gigantic theater. Everything's contactless. You order your food ahead of time. They have a concierge person out front to greet your party. They check off the names. Once everybody's there, they start the movie, and you get to pick it. It's really a great, and if you split the 150 between everybody attending, it's really, really cheap. Yeah. Do it. It's a good team building exercise, too for people that have a team left. <laughs> too, soon. Too, soon. too soon? Too soon? Too soon? I know. I, I, I am involved in so many virtual events now because uh, I'm a drag entertainer also full time. And so I am part of Drag Out the Vote, which is a bipartisan organization that is getting people out just to vote this year. And so I've done 75 virtual events in the last month and a half. So I am an expert at virtual programming an event because I have learned the power of Zoom and Zoom backgrounds, you name it, it's, it happens. So now when I, we have a, a weekly meeting with our staff and I, I, always I see people moving their mouth and I'm just like, I just turn off my camera now. And then I get all the instant messages. Oh, are you rolling your eyes too much? You turned your camera off. I'm like, <laughs> you know me so well. That's exactly what I'm doing. I'm like, rather than hurt the person's feelings that has, still hasn't learned the mute button, in seven and a half months, I'm just going to take myself out of the equation. And you can just guess in your mind what I'm doing. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Kind of falls along more the, the drag show work that you've been doing. Um, most of the Zoom stuff that I've been watching is, I mean, unless it's like a performer on the stage 
or it's one individual in front of a camera. What are you doing to make it different? You know, are you showing your like your full body? And... Oh, hell no. Okay. I'm only getting dressed from the waist up. That's all I'm putting energy into. <laughs> No, it's interesting because on Zoom, even if you have the camera zoomed out and you want to get a full body shot, the person's only that big on your screen. So most of the time you're just sitting in your chair. For me, my performances are all um, based for organizations. Like I'm hosting a lot of online galas. I'm doing a lot of like team happy hours across the country of people that have like little ERGs in their company, which are all queer friendly. And so people come together once a month to do a happy hour. I mean, I, once a month there's a company called Slalom Consulting and they hire me for all of their events company wide. And so they're a worldwide organization. So at the very beginning of COVID, they did a, a virtual happy hour, which had 700 people globally, the furthest being away in Auckland, New Zealand. And so it was just interesting to be a part of those conversations because, you know, they have me perform, they have me talk about some of their company news, you know, what's coming up in the new age of virtual working from home. Obviously with a consulting company, they work from home a lot or remotely. So it was like, they use me as a conduit to make it fun to hear the rules. Don't forget, we know when you're working, we know when you're not working, we know when you're logged in. Um, so those are a lot of the virtual events that I do or just for organizations for not my, a lot of my work the reason I got started in entertainment was to give back to nonprofits and so I donate a lot of my time just to offer my assistance to get people through this time because it's crazy you know and a lot of people aren't used to being home or being they're suffering you know from being lonely and that type of thing so if you can offer a fun element to bring to them in their living room anywhere that they are in the world is just a huge blessing because then they feel like they're still attached to a community. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, that's all I got. Thank you all so much. Um, please be sure to follow the Center on Colfax, lgbtqcolorado.org. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. <sighs> YouTube, whatever. Um, I will tell you, if you're doing virtual things and the two main platforms that people are paying attention to, number one is Instagram. It's out, uh, it's out, uh, its popularity is more so than Facebook because on Instagram you don't get all the political ads and all that other BS that's out there right now. Uh, and Facebook is the second. So if you're looking at captivating your audience and doing live takeovers or whatever you're gonna do to build up business and just get people engaged with your company. Because in the events world, a lot of people are stagnant right now and you're not doing anything. So how do you keep people engaged and how do you keep yourself front of mind? Just create some fun things online. It could be a recipe that someone that has never cooked in their life is making a dish. Utilize comedy. <laughs> That's what I say to that. But yeah, Instagram and Facebook are like your top two that you can use for any of those things. Yeah, but lgbtqcolorado.org. Uh, tune in on November 9th. We have a big press release coming out and some more information about Pride 2021 um, that we're really excited to announce. But we're waiting until after the election. <laughs> yes. All right, thank you all so much. It's been great.